Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. This is our second installment of our What's Up Doc series with FAM Surgery. I'm Dr. Peng Keng Xiang. I'm a urologist at FAM Surgery. So today we will still be on prostate cancer. And uh, before we start, a uh, shout out to Singapore Cancer Society. Um, we are proud to collaborate with them to continue on these uh, cancer awareness campaigns despite circuit breaker. Um, a lot of uh, activities cannot be carried out despite because of the circuit breaker. And we hope through these online sessions, we can continue to maintain awareness of cancer and I hope people step forward. So last week, we've uh, spoken about prostate cancer treatment prevention. We had uh, Dr. Mr. Tan TJ, a prostate cancer survivor, share the experience. Today, we uh, move along and we have two healthcare professionals. Um, they are a dietitian and a physiotherapist. And not many people know that uh, diet and physiotherapy are actually closely related to prostate cancer. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Derek Ong, the lead dietitian at uh, Eat Right, uh, and he has a great a lot of experience on uh, managing how pro cancer patients uh, eat better. So let's welcome Mr. Derek Ong. Hey, hi, Derek. Hi. Thank you for coming to our session today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Peng. Yeah. Yeah. So um, today we are talking about prostate cancer. So, mm -hmm. But before that, uh, maybe we can share with our audience um, in general, uh, is there any food or any kind of diet which uh, may prevent cancer in general or maybe may actually cause cancer in general? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it sounds a bit, Plase, but uh, actually, we, we actually, um, you know, uh, advocate uh, a, a healthy balanced diet, uh, you know, that's uh, mm. high in uh, antioxidants, fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains and lean proteins. Um, that's the basis of any healthy diet and also um, helpful towards uh, preventing cancer. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then also, um, um, th there are certain things to kind of take note of, like, you know, like, for instance, um, um, red meat and as particularly processed red meat uh, to mm. kind of limit that. Um, red meat, we say probably like maybe like twice a week. Uh, mm. It's probably fine, but try to keep it the, the lean and the non-processed and um, especially the, um, the, the charring and grilling, um, um, that's, that is, has been shown to be um, particularly, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not actually good for cancer mm. Like, yeah mm -hmm. so um that's the general kind of um guidance um with regards to diet for cancer yeah okay okay yep. so with regards to charring and grilling and mm. processed red meat yeah. uh, um, yep. in in uh, layman's terms uh, what kind of foods are, are these actually for example yep. Okay, so we've got the so the processed food, so things like your sausages, uh, uh luncheon meat. Oh, okay. very nice. Um, <laughs> okay, um, nice to eat, uh, yeah. and convenient, but but not exactly the the best lah. Okay. Yeah. And then for yeah. like charring, um, uh, some of you will know, you know, when you um, you know, do like barbecue, you know, you see yes. that 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 black portion, right? Yeah. The searing. Um, yeah, the searing and and particularly when 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 it charges black, uh, so that is particularly um, you know, uh, not, not good. really really not not health promoting in terms of where cancer yes. is 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 concerned. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, that is um that is really something to be to be mindful of. Uh, not not to say you can't take all these things at all, but mm. you know you should be limiting. And red meat itself probably not no more than probably up twice a week. Uh, mm. Yeah. Mm. What about healthy foods? Anything that uh, we should uh, stick to, eat more of? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So um, there, there are definitely uh, quite a number of um, uh, different sort of food components. So I mentioned um, generally about fruits and vegetables. Uh, mm. But specifically, um, in terms of vegetables, uh, we know that cruciferous vegetables, mm. so things like your spinach and you know broccoli and cabbage on these are particularly good um, 
uh, as as um, you know, in terms of, of preventing cancer and fighting cancer. Yeah. Mm. So um, that's that's really good. The other thing is also, uh, and a lot of people, you know, talk about this is lycopene, which is lycopene. an antioxidant. Yeah. So this is um, this is an antioxidant that's that's found in um, in um, a number of the um, red and orange kinds of fruits and vegetables. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, now I think you can see uh, yeah, yeah, up here, um, which is being flashed on screen right now, there's some yeah. um, uh, references to different sort of foods that are good mm. as well as, as not so good for, for mm. prostate cancer. Um, the words are a bit, uh, a bit small right now. Yeah. Um, and we, we'll give you the link a bit later. Where can like, we um, find this? Uh, what, what, what brochure is this? What material uh, is this? this is, yeah, so this is a diet and prostate cancer uh, booklet uh, produced by the Singapore Cancer Society. Oh, okay. um, so uh, it's is uh, really an excellent resource. Uh, yeah. Mm, mm, okay. And um, so it's 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 really um you know it's it's really a great resource for for people to kind of look at now. Uh, yeah. All right. So we'll share yeah. the link for this brochure uh, on our mm. website and over yeah. here. And mm. it's actually it should be available on the Singapore Cancer Society website as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So um next maybe we should uh, so there's the link for the booklet so please uh, click on it uh, feel free and uh, take your time to read through it it um, surely provides a lot of uh, good tips on what to eat what not to eat especially for prostate cancer uh, patients mm -hmm. okay so let's go back to prostate cancer in particular you know when i see my patients they may they may be prostate cancer patients they may be non-prostate cancer patients but they have heard a lot of certain foods and supplements that they mm. know are related to prostate. For example, turmeric, um, pomegranate, uh, lycopenes like you mentioned, uh, even like saw palmetto. So these are the few things that uh, many patients come to me and they, they show me their newspaper clippings. So can you give some advice on these things and are, are they really uh, related to prostate diseases in general? Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, first of all, I'd like to address the thing about uh, prostate-specific supplements. Mm. Uh, for instance, you mentioned uh, saw palmetto, uh, which um, is taken by um, a lot of patients with uh, benign prostate uh, hypertrophy or BPH. Yes, BPH. Yeah, so um, so it's, it's, it's probably good for that, but as to whether it's, it helps for prostate cancer, uh, that's another thing. La. Yeah. Mm. Um, we are not so sure about that. La. So it's more for BPH? Yes, it's really more for BPH. Yeah. So BPH yeah. is actually the non-cancer disease that affects uh, many men. Uh, that's not cancer, it's uh, prostate enlargement that uh, results in uh, urinary symptoms. Yeah. So, so a lot of men take all palmetto for that. Yeah. yeah. What, what about the rest? Yeah. So and then you mentioned things like um, turmeric, pomegranate, mm. so they're all very high, you know, high in antioxidants. So um, there is one uh, quite popular uh, supplement called Pommy Tea, mm. which um, there was a there was a clinical trial um, run on it a um, mm. couple of years back where they actually mm. gave it to um, men with prostate cancer, yeah, mm. Um, mm. and undergoing treatment, and then I found that actually it lowered the PSA levels, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, so uh, it it actually looked quite promising. As to whether it can be used as um, adjunctive treatment for prostate cancer, um, we're not so sure about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it definitely yeah. helps to reduce the, the PSA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess no harm, but then um, probably yeah. not something you just rely on to yeah. treat prostate yeah. cancer. Yeah. yeah, a lot of my patients uh, do take it, um, mm. but they are obviously on a, a main treatment, be it surgery mm. or radiotherapy or... Mm hormonal therapies, but uh, mm. they, they do not think that there's harm. And mm. I, I think if there's no harm, it's okay to take it. And they are, after all, antioxidants, yes. so, which yes. is uh, in general good for the body. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, any other advice that you would uh, give for patients who are actually undergoing surgery, maybe it before or after surgery? Yeah, any yeah. specific food or diet that you recommend? 
Um, probably no, no, no specific diet, but but I mean, but we know like you know, for instance, after surgery, um, um, the 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 body needs a bit more protein for um wound healing and recovery. Mm. Yeah. So if you stick to again the um lean proteins, you know, um your eggs and you know uh, lean lean um you know lean protein and all like mm. the chicken breast and all these, uh, you should mm. be fine. Um, and so avoiding, you know, the last uh, the the processed meats and all the all the charred red meats, uh, yeah. Mm, okay. Um, probably that that would actually help as well, uh. Okay, yeah. so protein for the healing, eh? Yes, yeah, and um, and of course, you know, we've got patients who are undergoing uh, radiotherapy, yes. as well, uh, So that 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 their protein needs definitely go up as well, uh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So at this point of time, um, for our audience listening in, do uh. Drop in your questions and uh, we will try to answer them uh, as and when or maybe later on in the QA session. So uh, thank you, TZ, for your, for your question. Uh, what is PSA? So at this point of time, um, PSA, is, PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. It is a cancer marker for prostate cancer. So a lot of uh, materials out there which talk about prostate cancer would definitely mention PSA. So um, patients with prostate cancer would have a higher PSA in the blood when uh, the blood test is taken. Okay, so um, thank you, Derek. Um, at the moment, uh, we will continue to wait for the question to come in and we'll come back to you later. Sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll share some of the other questions later. Um, at the moment, uh, let's go on to our next speaker. So we'll come back to you later, Derek. Thank you. Maurice, right. thanks. So let's uh, introduce our next guest speaker, Ms. Vanetta Wong. Vanetta is the lead physiotherapist of um, the Physio Studio Singapore. And uh, she has a lot of experience also with uh, managing prostate cancer patients. So let's welcome Vanetta. Hi, Dr. Peng. Yeah, thanks for inviting me this evening to welcome. talk about, you know, the complications that is relating to um, the prostatectomy. So for myself as a physiotherapy, my main role will be targeting on like helping uh, these patients with like uh, incontinence that is relating mm. to after the surgery. Yes. So incontinence is the... Uh, inability to control the urine resulting in a leak. It is kind of a major problem um, uh, affecting this group of patients because um, it actually has array of um, issues such as like causing ir skin irritations, urinary tract infection due to the use of like, you know, uh, diaper and also the inability to actually empty their bladder properly. Yeah, and also like, um, you know, it's inconvenient to move around using a diaper and this actually causes a lot of low cell esteem and social distancing, which doesn't help it at this, you know, moment as well. Or maybe it helps, yeah. So, and also it can, can cause like, you know, emotional issues, like, you know, um, affecting, um, like, you know, anxiety, depression, which um, can actually cause, you know, more, more issues coming out of the, from the surgery itself. So another problem um, that I'll be tackling is basically called um, strengthening because um, the entry point of the surgery still goes from the tummy, which will actually um, affect some of the abdominal muscles during when uh, it's being cut through. So we need to understand how to actually work that muscles properly because it actually has a major role in facilitating your, our pelvic floor muscle contraction. So looking at the diagram now, uh, shows us uh, specific like structures that can actually helps us with our continence and all the structures um, could actually be damaged during the surgery itself. So particularly our um, um, external urethral sphincter, which is actually below the, the bladder is in yellow, is a ring-like structure, uh, muscles that contracts involuntary um, to prevent the leakage of urine from the bladder down to the urethra. And below it, just below the prostate, uh, 
It's our pelvic floor muscles that connects from the front, the pubic bone to our end of the spine. And this is the important muscles that I'll be actually uh, touching on because this is the muscles that we can train to alleviate and cure the incontinence. And you can see that it actually passes through the urethra and also uh, our anus, which is the um, opening up to our, uh, our rectum. Yeah, this is where I will be actually assessing the strength of the patient after, uh, before and after the surgery. And uh, yeah, so let's move on to um, looking at, you know, how, uh, what are the factors that can actually affect this group of patients in terms of um, the recovery from the incontinence. So I've mentioned um, the anatomical structure. So if let's say more structures uh, that maintains the continence are being affected during the surgery, then of course the, the outcome will be actually poorer. And also the stage of the tumor will also affect um, how much uh, the doctor could actually salvage the neurovascular bundle, which is in charge of um, innovating, uh, providing signal to our muscles. And uh, the type of surgical technique as well. And also like, uh, you know, your uh, prior to your surgery, you might do like a urodynamics measurement, which is a test that looks into the muscles function uh, of the nerve and bladder. And radiotherapy um, is the main concern. So some um, radiotherapists actually advise patient to actually improve in, in their continence control before they could actually go for um, radiotherapy. Reason being because radiotherapy itself can actually irritate the bladder and the sphincter itself and it actually causes uh, the incontinence to be worsened. So for patients who is actually about uh, 65 years and below usually have better outcome yeah, because of um, younger age and their muscle control are usually better. So the last point, which is the International Prostate Symptom Score, which I will share the link. Yeah, it's actually a seven skill. Um, yeah, feel free to actually test yourself out on how well is your urinary symptoms. Yeah, this will determine whether you actually uh, turns out to be having better continence control um, after the surgery itself. So it's a seven skill um, I Okay, so um, it's a seven um, item. So it actually looks at how well you empty your bladder, how frequent you go to the toilet, and whether you have a lot of stop and start. Um, we call that the intermittency during the urination itself, and how urgent you are. Can you actually postpone the urination, or you actually uh, need to go immediately once you feel it? And how strong is your stream? Is it weak or is it strong? And and whether you need to really uh, strain when you actually to begin um, a urination and how many times you need to get up at night to go to the toilet. And this are uh, being scored from zero to five and having more scores than less actually um, gives us poorer uh, prognosis. So the patients with higher score tend to have more incontinence per se. And uh, yeah, and all in all, they also look into the quality of life um, that this actually urinary symptoms will actually affect this patient. So this will actually, all these factors will affect our um, outcome from the surgery. So let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, so this is actually uh, looking at how common um, incontinence is after the surgery. The first so the first row of um, arrows shows us that after six months of the surgery, it can vary from 8 to 87 percent of people still having incontinence, which is a high percentage. And uh, this was without physiotherapy. So as the uh, time frame, you know, carries on at one year, it reduced by half and then two years time reduced by 10. So which means that it's still spontaneous improvement even without physio. But the, the, the time frame is really long for them to actually get um, better. And at 15 years, if nothing is being done, they have no physio, they might, eventually, they might actually worsen after that. So with physiotherapy, uh, when particularly pelvic floor muscles education is being taught, 
um, they actually see improvement within three months. Only 12% of them actually remain incontinent, so which means they actually regain continence in 80, 88% of the uh, patients. And in one year, almost like all of them actually have full recovery. Only 5% actually still have incontinence as compared to people who did not uh, go through the pelvic floor education. Okay, so, so, it, so it's proven that um, physiotherapy does help um, after prostate cancer surgery. Yeah. So when patients are referred to you, Vanetta, um, what, what can he expect? Let's say he's referred to you before surgery for assessment and then he goes for surgery. What, what, what can he expect? So, um, well... For a patient during the pre-operation assessment, we are looking at finding the baseline of um, their continence, you know, um, even before the surgery. Because a lot of them before they go for surgery, they might have some form of urinary, uh, urinary, urinary, urinary symptoms, which is due to could be a BPH for many years. So they might have some form of urge incontinence, which is like an intense urge to urinate and, and there's no ability to wait. So other than that, um, we will also administer what I have gone through, the international uh, prostate symptoms um, questionnaire to find out what is their baseline so that they actually have a mindset of where they stand. And that is very important to have that kind of um, um, set their standards to have that kind of expectation you know, that they are not, that they may not think that is a uh, really, you know, a brave decision. Yeah. So apart from that, we will look into like other histories. So we will take like some history to see whether patient has got spinal conditions that could also affect the continence. Mm. Yeah. Um, and also we will do some assessment to check the baseline muscle strength. All right. And this will, we will allow us to actually know that, you know, patient could actually contract their muscles or not. Yeah. So after which then they go for surgery, then they come back to us for post-operation. And um, usually, you know, um, as for you, you will send the patient to me as soon as you think that the patient is fit. Like, you know, after the catheter is being removed, usually about two weeks. Yes. Yeah. So... After which, you know, um, I will start off with like my pelvic floor uh, muscle training, yeah, um, which is a program that I would see them for like 12 weeks at least. And every week it will be a one hour session. Yeah. So this time round, I will reassess their strength again to find out what is the baseline after the surgery. And then at the same time, I will teach them how to quantify the urine loss as a, an as re, as an outcome measure for them to realize or whether they improve or not. So with lesser urine loss being better after uh, uh, with time. So um, after the, the actually to correct myself, it before the surgery, um, I would actually set an expectation and inform them that actually they might need to uh, prepare some adult diaper because incontinence is really quite uh, inevitable. Yeah, especially in the beginning uh, of the, just right after the post, um, the surgery itself. And that's when we will come back to like, you know, goal setting and then uh, go into like the pelvic floor muscle training phase. Yep, let's move on to how I will teach them how to do the pelvic floor muscles uh, contraction. So pelvic floor muscle contraction, another name for it is called Kegel exercise. So what we are targeting is actually the, the pink color band that is at the bottom. It looks like a hammock. So when you actually contract, you actually try to lift it up as you squeeze from the bottom lifting up with no breath holding and no pulling in of the belly button, which means you shouldn't be using your tummy muscles to activate that neither should you be using your buttock muscles. So you should feel as though like you prevent yourself from passing wind, all right? And or you trying to um, hold the midstream of your urine, that kind of feeling, but not to not to really use, do that at, uh, as a form of training. And the first phase usually will introduce like slow contraction. So 
patients will actually slowly contract and, and, and hold for 10 seconds and before they release and uh, for 10 seconds. Quick contractions is something which I will only introduce after they have gotten the slow contraction right. Yeah, so because uh, it might be quite traumatizing in the beginning to perform that because they have the surgery, uh, the connections between the urethra to the bladder, and that could actually cause a lot of pressure in, in the wound itself. So, other um, treatment involved, apart from like teaching them how to do pelvic floor contractions, if let's say, all right, for for patients with like maybe very weak um, pelvic floor muscles uh, of zero, no contraction at all, to very weak contraction of two, all right, I will introduce electrical stimulation as we see in this slide, all right? So electrical stimulation actually helps to enhance the contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. So it will be actually administered through an anal probe. So it will go through uh, via the anal, um, um, the, the anal channel, and this uh, will increase the electrical um, in, impulses until the pulses, until patient could actually feel a tingle kind of sensation. It should be strong, but not painful. And with this, it actually provides a sensory feedback to patient that, oh, this is the muscles that I'll be working on and I'll have to squeeze on that. And when they, does, when they do that, um, they will actually uh, try to also incorporate the way that I've taught them how to do the pelvic floor uh, muscles to hold and squeeze and lift instead of bearing down and pushing out. Yeah. So another effective treatment uh, is biofeedback, as we can see in this the next slide. Yeah. So biofeedback, uh, as you can see, it contains like a, you know uh, it has a screen on the machine itself. Yeah, so this is a handheld machine, which is really convenient. Patient could actually hold it. Uh, of course, it's also connected to the probe. So once inserted, they actually look at the screen. So as they contract and squeeze, the graph goes up. And then as they relax, the graph goes down. So this actually raises confidence on like, you know, correct activation. Patient can see it. They, can, they know that they actually are doing it right. So it also helps to quantify, you know, contractions when they have a number to look at. They actually feel that, you know, they are doing something, they feel motivated and, and they actually um, helps to, to, to bring on the, the right contraction as well. So these are the main uh, activities they will do in the clinic. And apart from that, some advice I will give them is on uh, good toilet habits, as we can see in the next slide. Yeah, so good toileting habits involve not just a uh, good position. Um, we also look into like, oh, patients um, may tend to go all right to the toilet when their bladder is not full. And this, this may probably um, cause them to be unable to feel their bladder properly. Yeah. So, so if they don't, feel the bladder properly, you don't really train the bladder muscles. So, so what we actually advise them is to be able to hold the bladder, all right, uh, for as long as they can, uh, maybe after the second urge, then they go to the toilet, and this will slowly teach them and improve the bladder feeling uh, ability. Yeah, so looking at the diagram or the picture uh, in this slide, we look, we, we uh, actually, this is actually a good toileting position uh, for, for seated toilets. Yeah, I, I do. Um, this is actually lifting up with like a, um, with their feet on the block, which brings their knee above the hip. So this actually straightens the passageway for the rectum and so that, you know, uh, you don't really need to strain and, and the, the stool could actually come out is more easily. Um, I don't really encourage squatting because, I mean, after surgery, you wouldn't want to strain the wound. And at the same time, you are very, when you're squatting, you're actually putting more pressure down the pelvic floor muscles, which makes it even harder to train it up. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and of all, as, as best as possible not to strain. 
So, which means if you feel the urge to go to, you know, for, for the big business, you make sure that, you know, it should be only five minutes. You go in, finish, and you come out. Do not sit at the toilet bowl. Do not read your newspaper, or, you know, because all this could actually strain on your pelvic floor muscles. And having said that, let's go into the topic on constipation. This is something which is really important to look into as well. So for constipation, we we uh, I'm looking at like you know people with a with difficulty passing motion more than five minutes. They need to sit and strain, and their uh, feces are usually like in pellet form or even hard and and hard to actually. Uh, force it out. So um, a good stool should be smooth and uh, kind of moist and it should be in one piece and there's no pellet at all. So how do you actually improve that? It's by through like high fiber diet um, and this could actually, high fiber diet could also help us with weight management which actually reduces the stress on our pelvic floor muscles. And in order to, to uh, I mean, if let's say even fiber diet doesn't help you, you could actually uh, get fibro gel um, or maybe lactulose from your doctor. Yeah. So in order for us to actually, uh, because when you take high fiber diet, you actually need more water. So you could actually drink a good, like, you know, uh, six to eight glasses, probably eight glasses of water, which is about two liters of water a day. And that could include also like, you know, um, soupy items. Yeah. Uh, if you do, take like, you know, soups more, maybe you can cut down on the amount that you drink. Yeah. So uh, apart from that, also we try to reduce caffeine intake. Yeah. Caffeine intake is not so much to prevent constipation, but rather it actually irritates the bladder. Yeah. So studies have shown that um, 1.5 cup of coffee doesn't actually uh, cause much of a worsening of your incontinence in moderate uh, in incontinence patient. So this is a study done on women, but um, because it's really rare to do it on men. So this is based on a study that is done on women. Yeah. So um, let's move into exercise. So this, okay, the previous chart shows that, um, the previous chart shows like, you know, some uh, of the factors can actually improve in our, um, like, you know, cancer related fatigue, anxiety, um, also like, you know, uh, physical functions. So, okay. So which means we'll, you need to exercise because exercise itself has shown that, you know, it can actually helps to prevent uh, at the, the lower down the risk factors relating to uh, prostate cancers itself. Yeah. So I've sh shared a link which is um, uh, you can actually look at the dosage of the exercises to improve in some of the factors uh, how on how like exercise could influence. And um, based on that, we look into like exercising three times a week, 30 minutes each time, moderate to vigorous intensity. So before we go into uh, further this discussion on like, you know, deeper discussion on the aerobic exercises, Let's talk about like core strengthening. We could actually address some of the exercises that you really are interested in later on in the Q&A. So what is core strengthening? Uh, we are looking at four major muscles here. So this four major muscles form like a Coke can kind of a three-dimensional shape. The diaphragm on the top, multifidus at the back of the spine, deep towards the uh, in the spine itself, and also the transverse abdominis in the front, which is a horizontal muscles, it's not your apex. So when it contracts, it actually forms a corset. And at the bottom is our pelvic floor muscles. So when all these muscles work together, it, it actually forms a close pack three-dimensional uh, core stability for you. All right, so that is why I need to address how important it is for us to train our core, all right, in order to help with our pelvic floor muscles. So let's look into, uh, let's, let me show you a video, all right, on some of the exercises that I'll be demonstrating. Yeah, and this 
particular exercise Pilates helps with core strengthening. So this is pelvic tilt. All these exercises um, can be done like maybe say two weeks after the surgery itself. So long that the wound is on the external is, is healed. It's very gentle exercise. Look at how I actually stabilizes my pelvis as I move my hip. So with that, it indirectly actually works the deep core muscles. So as you feel that you know your uh, stamina improves, you could actually add on resistant band in the exercises or you could use weights as well. Yeah, but most importantly, in the first phase after two weeks are very gentle exercises. For straight leg raise, I would advise probably, you know, after four weeks. So I will usually in introduce this exercise after pelvic floor muscles is being uh, thought and they are actually supposed to work the Kegel, the, the pelvic floor muscles or the Kegel exercises while they are actually doing the exercises. So this is working on the hips as we stabilize our pelvis. Cemental bridges are great for your glutes and your spine itself as well. So it can be done, um, say about six weeks after the surgery itself, when the wound is supposed to be healed. Yeah, so it works the individual spinal segment, your multifeeders, your at the back, your transverse abdominis in the front, and hundreds will probably come in at a later phase, about after six to eight weeks time. So it works on the front core and with varying positions that you can progress as well. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, if you have further questions regarding the exercises, you can ask me, you know, um, during the Q&A as well. And I will answer you later. Thank you very much, Vanetta. So uh, definitely, you are, it looks like a patient has lots of things to do with you when he sees you before and after surgery. So after all that, are there any key takeaway messages for, for them? Uh, definitely, let me summarize this. the most important points, all right, is to come for pre-op physiotherapy ass assessment because it's really important that you learn how to contract the muscles before you go for the op, before you lost the sensation, before you even like, you know, uh, because after the operation, it's really difficult to learn how to contract. So you need to build the motor memory first. And start physiotherapy as soon as possible after the surgery. So when the catheter is removed or when all the complications from the surgery is being solved. And most importantly, work on the pelvic floor muscles uh, is the main key to, your, to regaining your continence. All other muscles will not work if you don't work your pelvic floor muscles. And then uh, look into the you know, good diet, which helps to prevent cancer from relapse and also to prevent you know, incontinence from worsening and also learning the right toileting habits. And not forgetting like, you know, to be uh, active, you know, work on aerobics, resistance training, um, and also the core muscle strengthening to facilitate the pelvic floor muscle contraction. Thank you, thank you very much. So that was a lot of information on physiotherapy for prostate cancer management. So um, we have some questions that have come in and I think we'll try to uh, engage these questions. So in the meantime, for all of you who are online with us, uh, please uh, feel free to um, ask any questions or comments that you may have or even share experiences that you may have. Um, so let's bring back Derek. Hi, Derek. Welcome back. Yeah. So uh, we have some questions. Um, I think uh, Simhui asks, uh, my father drinks a lot of coffee. Is it really good in terms of prostate health? So how does coffee affect prostate health if it does at all? Yeah. So, um, so coffee, we know it, it contains uh, polyphenols, which are some, you know, uh, is a form of uh, antioxidants. Uh. Oh, okay. So, uh, it could possibly help, mm. um, you know, in in you know in 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 terms of the cancer, uh. Yeah. Mm. Um, but then again, you know, if you're if you're drinking too much, um, if you're drinking too much uh, coffee and caffeine, then that can sort of lead to other issues as well. Some people are actually caffeine sensitive. 
Yeah, so I think it's a bit of a balance. It depends really on how much is um, how much coffee really is, is really taking. Mm. Yeah, so mm. probably you know probably about two cups is. Okay, two so cups we, a day. Yeah, yeah most of us have about yeah. one in the morning and one in the afternoon. I think that should yeah. be enough for the day. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Mr. T yeah, Anthony asked uh, something about redox signaling molecules. Do you have any experience with that? Wow, okay. <laughs> redox. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm afraid not. Yeah, but I think this, okay. this again, you know, uh, this is this is an area that I, I have to confess, I, I, I don't. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's probably very a bit more in the experimental side. Yeah, it's a bit more esoteric, mm. Yeah. Mm, okay. So probably we will not recommend any, anything definite at this point of time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Sylvia asks an uh, interesting question: uh, Consuming chicken or pork meat, uh, will the hormones or antibiotics inside these meats affect cancer patients? Um, Let's say cancer in general and may not yeah. be restricted to prostate cancer. Yeah. Look, because the, you know, if, uh, I mean, the, I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the the hormones are injected and all that. Mm. But the, the thing is that as long as the, the, the you know, the um, the meats are sort of properly cooked and all, um, pretty much the, you know, the hormones and all these are pretty much all okay. destroyed. Uh. Yeah. Okay. So they'll be, they'll be inactivated. You see? So okay. I don't think there's... Um, any great issue there. Okay, yeah. so that's, that's reassuring. So mm. Gregory, thanks for joining us. Uh, so Gregory asked another question on diet. Why is it cooked tomatoes? Uh, are cooked tomatoes uh, good for prostate health? So maybe ah. I think he's trying to ask, is there a difference between cooked tomatoes and raw tomatoes in the salads, for example? Yes, yeah. So remember I was uh, talking about lycopene earlier? Mm. Yeah. So and we know tomatoes is you know one of the you know one of the you know nice uh, rich sources of lycopene. Mm. So uh, what happens in lycopene is that uh, when you cook the vegetable, um, it actually goes into a more bioavailable form. It's converted to more bioavailable, so it's more readily used by the body. Mm. So it's it's one of the, usually you know usually any sort of heat and cooking you usually you usually destroy the antioxidant but in this case it actually makes it it makes it better see oh, so this is one okay. of the lycopene is one of those um I guess um you know it's antioxidant which which works a bit differently la. so definitely uh, cook your tomatoes um okay. and then instead of having them raw if you're after the lycopene great great that's an interesting fact. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's move on to another question from Sim Hui. Does these ex exercises apply to women? I think she was referring to those uh, pelvic floor exercises. Um, I think, let me address, okay, the pelvic floor exercises is really applicable for the women as well. Um, I mean, for women's health is mainly to do with, like, you know, after pregnancy or um, postnatal kind of care. Yeah, as well. Um, mm. So with incontinence, um, mm. yeah, also. Mm. Um, apart from that, the exercises, like the other exercises, like the core strengthening, mm. is also um, uh, suitable for probably anybody of any age. Mm. Yeah, so long that they do not have other uh, orthopedic conditions that affect their spine, you know, anything that causes pain. Um, I mean, should they be um, unable to perform the exercise or not sure if they should perform the exercise, they should actually consult a, a professional, a, a doctor, their doctors, or probably to look for a physio like me as well. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So uh, that's great. So Tizania asked another uh, similar question. So does a recovery after surgery uh, differ for genders between uh, men and women or is it dependent on how much uh, exercise they do? Mm, when you're talking about post-surgery, prostate only applies to men. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if it, it, it varies even between patients itself. Yeah, mm. so from like um, three months to some of them really up to one year. So mm. as you can, I mean, if you remember just now I shared on the incidence of incontinence that um, it can be easily 87% having incontinence at three months and then um, down to 50%, down to 10% in two years. So it is widely variable and there is, um, yeah, 
and it, it depends on the type of like you know the cancer the patient has as well yeah yeah okay all right thank you very much yeah yeah so uh so when what stage would be the best time to to see your phys, for see the patients for physiotherapy should they see um before or after treatment or what they should see us before the treatment like i mentioned to improve in the model uh, memory of the muscles prior to the surgery mm. so that they they get a, they grasp the idea on how to perform the exercises mm. correctly mm -hmm. and um, after they come back to see us most of the time patient with pre uh, op assessment they tend to be able to actually contract immediately Great. and yeah outcome is also better for them Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And also thank you very much to Derek. We uh, really appreciate your presence with us and sharing your, your vast experience with our audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Fung. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, though well, that was very useful and um, I hope all of you who have joined us uh, enjoyed that session. So um, before we go, I would like to uh, maybe share that uh, with the coming to the end, we are coming to the end of our circuit breaker measures, as you have heard over the media, and we are happy to announce that uh, all our clinic locations under FAM surgery will be fully operational from 2nd of June onwards. And uh, for those who, of you who still um, prefer to stay home, our teleconsults are also available at the same time. But do um, take your precautions when you come outdoors now, come out of your homes with the ending of the circuit breakers. We should all still, vig stay, we should all still stay vigilant during this period and do our part to keep the COVID virus at bay. So once again, thank you. I enjoyed uh, hosting this visit. I hope uh, this uh, session, I hope you also enjoyed uh, listening to us. So stay home and stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>